Jamie Nelson served 1,047 days for a rape he did not commit. His accuser, Kathy Fordham, would eventually be exposed as a serial liar and convicted. People enter our lives every day, and this is where Kathy Fordham entered mine, Patty's Pub. Kathy Fordham was hired to be a bartender at Patty's Pub, and my father was a patron of that pub. Uh, one day, my father and I went there for a beverage, a drink, and Kathy was there. For Jamie Nelson, that chance meeting with a neighborhood bartender would unleash a chain of events that would transform his life and mark the beginning of his struggle against the criminal justice system. I had absolutely no romantic or intimate involvement with Kathy Fordham. Uh, the only thing I ever did was um, we would go out socializing, her and some friends, and one night she phoned me needing a ride home. And at that time, she had Christine with her. Christine, Kathy's best friend, caught Jamie's attention. We developed a relationship shortly after meeting, uh, discovered that we had a few things in common. We liked to share time together. That led to dating, which led to living together. Everything kind of progressed. Kathy did not react well to her best friend's involvement with Jamie. I think she was extremely aggravated that I didn't find an interest in her romantically, that I chose her friend. She would soon begin to vent her frustrations against Jamie, her weapon of choice, the police. She found an opportunity, picked a fight, then charged him with assault, claiming that he was her boyfriend. The interference from Kathy Fordham, I strongly believe, uh, was fueled by her desire to see my relationship with Christine fail. Shortly after, Christine would discover she was pregnant. That's when I realized there was serious issues with Christine. Her complete psyche changed as soon as she got pregnant. When Christine's and my relationship started to fail, there was a lot of pressure applied to our relationship by Kathy Fordham, uh, all negative all in an effort to extract me from Christine's life. I eventually separated with Christine very early on in what was a tumultuous relationship, and I had the full intention of doing everything I could. I just knew that I wanted to be my child's father and secured a lawyer and made every effort I could to be prepared and ready to step forward and go for custody of the child as soon as the child was born. Jamie moved into his father's place, but trouble was not far behind. Even before the first charge of assault had reached trial, Kathy Fordham would accuse Jamie of harassment and other offenses an additional six times. However, Jamie would soon find an ally of his own, Marie Verdon. Marie was a sounding board and a, a person of strength that I would turn to quite often when I was going through those, those rough times. We met in, I think, 91, 92, or, and um, from that moment we became friends, and I kind of thought one day we'd probably be together. Marie and I became considerably closer as the relationship between Christine and I dissolved. Then Marie got pregnant. By the time the twins, Matthew and Melissa, were born, Dustin, Jamie's son with his ex, was two months old. Jamie was now a proud family man, raising three young children, including Christina, Marie's daughter from a previous relationship. He was more determined than ever to get access to his firstborn son, and that's when the nightmare unfurled. I guess you could say this is where everything started. Marie and I lived right in that apartment with my father and it's the site of where I was arrested twice based on allegations leveled by Fordham. While he was fighting for access to Dustin, the first charge of assault filed several months earlier had finally reached trial. I uh, very foolishly allowed myself to get into an argument with Kathy and during the course of the argument, she literally attacked me. She just flew at me and in the course of defending myself, I slapped her. 
I went downstairs outside the building that she lived in. I Didn't sat deny on the... that he slapped her. He actually called the police. The string of subsequent charges she had filed against him did not work in his favor. That occurrence netted me 60 days in custody. But at the same time, that put the brakes on our efforts to have custody, custody with Dustin. With Dustin. Every time we would get granted access to Dustin, Kathy Fordham, Christine's best friend, would accuse Jamie of something. And the allegations always progressed in seriousness. The second allegation, she alleged that I kidnapped her from the back of Patty's pub and told her to stay out of my family court business. She was clever, but she was sloppy at the same time because the night that she picked, in her mind when she created this allegation, the bar was closed to the public. I was stunned, I, was, I couldn't believe it, but I was convicted. And that time I received a 120 day sentence. Kathy was always able to project how capable she was of convincing any authority that she came across that her allegations were legitimate. And that's what prompted our move to just outside of Castleman, Ontario. 45 minutes away from her, we thought we were safe. Marie and I had just moved into a, a beautiful country, rural setting home. Just our baby, just our youngest son, Riley. Our twins, twins were, were two. two. Christina was five. We had a, a flourishing pastry sugar design business. Uh, life couldn't have been any better. Unfortunately, getting Dustin to participate in the family bliss was proving difficult. I had a family court conference hearing, and at that point I was granted the most access we had ever been given. So we were extremely excited about that. But that didn't happen. Three consecutive weekends went by. Every time I would show up at Christine's door, uh, she wouldn't provide Dustin. There was always an excuse. And on the fourth weekend, uh, again, she wasn't prepared to give me Dustin. And I, I told her that I was just prepared to go to court Monday morning for full custody. Uh, a few minutes later, she came down carrying Dustin and uh, we got to have our weekend, and it just happened to be the, the weekend we were celebrating Easter. Easter would prove to be the calm before the storm that was about to destroy their lives. Jamie was at the store um, with um, two sons, Dustin and Matthew. It was an ice cream road trip, uh, and away we went. Melissa and Riley and Christina were in the house. Police showed up and asked for Jamie. I said, what is it about? and they told me to pack my bags and run, that he was a monster. I thought I was pulling into my driveway to go sit down with everybody on the living room floor and eat a gallon of ice cream. And before I could put the van in park, the door was flung open. The next thing I remember is feeling cold steel against my temple. I was terrified. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see Marie standing at the kitchen door. I could see terror on her face. Uh, I could see dread on Christina's face. She didn't know what was happening. I was five, I believe, five and a half when it happened. Honest, I don't remember anything of that day. I think I was a little too young. I'm in the van, I've got a gun against my head. I've got two sons behind me still strapped in. They threatened him that if he tried to run that they would shoot him right there in front of the children. I asked her to please contact Ken Hall immediately, let him know that I was in custody. It flashed through my mind that this was something Kathy Fordham had initiated again. At, at the time of his arrest, I had known Jamie for a few years and I'd represented him two or three times. When I got to the station, one of the first constables that I saw was a gentleman that I worked with for several years in the hospitality industry, and he had moved on to policing. He had this just intense look of disgust and anger on his face, and he looked at me and he said, call a lawyer. And I was just left wondering, like, what the hell is happening that somebody that I've known for years and had a very good relationship with. He came to my mother's funeral. I was at his father's. Now all of a sudden I'm outcast. I didn't know until the detectives from Ottawa came in and they just bluntly told me that I was a sexual deviant monster. Jamie would ask the detective in charge for a polygraph. He said, absolutely not. I don't have any reason not to believe that young lady. And with that, I, I firmly believe his investigation was over. 
He was charged with sexual assault. In the old days, so to speak, it was called rape. He was just in shock. Uh, as a defense lawyer uh, of 30 years, uh, I often don't get the sense of innocence right from the beginning, but then this was unusual in that sense, that right from the very beginning, he was an unusual client. But in the eyes of the law, Jamie Nelson was far from innocent. I was immediately thrown into an isolation cell. I had nothing in that cell but four walls and a floor and me for three weeks. That's how they kept me. I had no clothing. They kept me dirty. They kept me filthy. They kept me hungry. They were trying to break me. They were trying to strip every ounce of dignity out of me. And thank God I believe dignity has to be surrendered. It can't be taken. So they didn't win that one. But they were draining his spirit in a way that only his loved ones could see. Well, there was really nothing normal about how he was. He was not the same. It's incredibly difficult to defend yourself from a jail cell. You have zero contact with the people that you need, uh, family, witnesses, alibi, lawyers. They're all a million miles away when you're in that cell. You've got to keep in mind I've had several encounters and several experiences with this woman. I knew how far she would be prepared to go. So losing my bid for bail depleted any strength that I had inside, and I reached the lowest point of my life. I decided the easiest way to, to kill myself would be to suffocate myself through hanging. Once I had the rope braided, I made the plan to loop it around the metal box that protected the smoke detector on the ceiling. And then that night, I would wait for my cellmate to go to sleep. At approximately 10.30 that night, the nurse delivered his meds. A half hour later, he was asleep, looped the rope, jumped. When you're on that side of the bars, and there's no way, there's no hope, there's no crack, there's nothing, there's no light. You give up. I decided the easiest way to, to kill myself would be to suffocate myself through hanging. I didn't even think about it, I just jumped. The pain was agonizing, I lost the sensation in my arms, I couldn't even lift them to try to pull myself up. I started to spin, just the nature of the way the, the rope was made, it was unwinding and it made my feet kink the stainless steel sink, which woke my cellmate. He jerked me down. I don't know what he was thinking when he did that. I, I was in shock, everybody was in shock. Now I had to try and explain my actions to my wife and to my father, why I reached that low. But once I realized who was in my corner and who was with me, that they supported me and they loved me, I regretted that decision. Strengthened by their support, Jamie was ready to prepare for the fight. When a woman cries rape, the system responds. And I knew that I was going to be facing the steepest uphill battle of my life. To prepare for the case, he provided me with uh, names of witnesses I was to call, get them subpoenaed, and that took a few months to do. The defense was the truth. The defense was proving that the event never took place. A trial is a moving target, so you never know what's going to happen. We had good, credible evidence to call to rebut what she was saying. Uh, no one could look into the crystal ball, but we were fairly confident. Jamie had already spent more than six months in detention when the trial began. Essentially, the case against Jamie was a statement that was dated the 29th of April, 1996. She was alleging that uh, the events in question actually happened at the end of February. In her statement, Fordham reported that on February 28, 1996, Jamie Nelson, an ex-boyfriend, had sneaked into her apartment building in the early morning hours, waited in ambush, then viciously attacked her. She said she was thrown around her apartment like a rag doll, kicked repeatedly, and raped. 
There was a lag in two months between the date that she alleged the attack and the date that she went to the police. I don't know if that throws any rag flags up for anybody in this room, but it certainly does for me. In court, that would make little difference given the power of Fordham's testimony. She did absolutely everything she could to draw as much sympathy from the court. Uh, Kathy knows that society drapes victims of sexual assault with the most sacred robes we have as a society. So she knew she was well protected by that system and all she had to do was play the victim. And I think she did it a little too well. She cried at the right points. She took breaks at the right points. She got furious at the right points. She, she, it was just as if she was doing everything off of a script. Couldn't believe that they were believing everything she was saying. I was watching the judge's face and I saw him drinking everything in. During the course of the trial, we called uh, evidence with regard to the family court matter that was going on with regard to Dustin. I firmly believe that I was given, or at least I hoped I was given, the same consideration, the same equitable chance to, to tell my story. Essentially, the case for the defense was, was twofold. Number one, uh, Jamie testified on his own behalf and denied that the, the event ever took place. And secondly, that we had placed them on notice of alibi. It bothered me, too, for them to state that um, my testimony was um, that I wasn't credible because I'm his wife and maybe I would lie for him. What reason would I have to lie for him? If he did something like that, he deserves to go to jail. But he didn't do anything like that, you know? I do not need to be with someone who, who abuses women and beats people up, you know? The medical report from her attendance at the hospital was used by both the Crown Attorney and myself. We had doctors saying she wasn't in distress. She never suggested she was raped. She didn't present with the injuries that a rape victim would have. So nothing fit her story. His father and I and my parents, we all thought, but there's just no way he can be convicted. No, there's just no proof of anything. The trial would last nine days. Finally, the outcome was at hand. When he started to read his judgment, about 15, 20 words into it, I saw Ken hang his head. So there was something that the judge said that I didn't pick up on, but Ken obviously did. The judge found that uh, although there was inconsistencies in her statement and her evidence was not perfect, he favored her evidence over that of the defense and convicted uh, Jamie. I find Mr. Nelson guilty on all counts. It never entered my mind that I would be convicted. How can you be convicted of something that never took place? Judge Fraser imposed a three and a half year sentence to uh, express the denunciation of sexual assault uh, charges against women. He also evoked uh, the provision which uh, prevented Jamie from applying for parole uh, until 50% of his sentence had been served. He did that as an extra measure to instill confidence to Kathy Fordham to reassure her that the justice system worked. Everybody I believe that was there uh, family-wise just cried and could not believe it. I, I knew that at that point I was just, the life that I had was gone. The last time I saw any member of my family uh, was the day that I was sentenced. And, uh, and then I was, I was taken away from them. The Jamie Nelson case to me was uh, every defense counsel's worst nightmare come true. The, the client that in your heart of hearts, you, you feel he's innocent, um, he's been honest with you from the beginning, you have independent evidence to support what he's, he's saying to you, and then gets convicted. It's just a horrible experience, and it, it's one that you live with night after night after night, and you replay the trial. What should I have done? What shouldn't I have done? I firmly believe the judge was predisposed to finding me guilty just based on the fact of my past contact with Kathy Fordham. The first opportunity I had to speak with Ken about it was later that afternoon in the basement of the courthouse when he came to see me before I was transferred to the detention center. He just hugged me and, and he told me that we're going to find a way to get out of this, to clear me. Um, 
It was a long way home. We lived 45 minutes, an hour out of Ottawa, and it seemed like it took hours to get there. I think one of the hardest parts is, I think trying to realize what just happened, trying to figure out what went wrong and what made them make that decision, what made the judge believe her, what, you know? I was dumbfounded, the system that was supposed to protect and serve and put the bad guys away. Instead of the bad guy being put away, the good guy got taken away this time. From my research into miscarriages of justice, in a case where there's an allegation of, of sexual assault, there's often DNA that can sometimes rule somebody out. And in Jamie's case, because no sexual assault occurred, there was no DNA. It became a, a matter of he said, she said. And given, the, I guess, the political climate of Ottawa at that time also, the alleged victim was considered more believable than Jamie, and he was convicted of something that never occurred. Knowing that he had done nothing wrong, knowing that he was that innocent man, I think was the hardest part. You think about prison, what goes on in a prison, I was scared for him. Every federal inmate starts their journey uh, at Millhaven Assessment Unit so they can determine what your correction plan is going to be. I was subjected to phallometric metering, and what that is, is a mercury-filled balloon is placed around the base of your penis. It's plugged into a computer, and then the individual is shown they're called postcards. To see what you respond to, consensual sex, forced sex, uh, all kinds of different variations of sex. If you have a response, penis enlarges, the mercury fills, senses the, the change in pressure, it gets recorded somehow in the computer, they analyze that, come up with some kind of a basis to determine what level of degree of deviant you are. And at the end of the day, um, I came to learn that I had zero to no response to all of the postcards except for the consensual sex. It was determined that I would need to do two programs, anger management and a serious sexual behavior modification program. I remember challenging the doctor that performed the test and I said, if I have zero to no response, how can you justify that I need these programs? And he says, well, you, you have to be one of them. Low, medium, or high. You know, you have to be one of those brackets of sex offender. I did the anger management program. If there was anything I could do to help myself control anger, rage, and emotion, I wanted to do it. With respect to the sexual behavior modification program, I would not do it. I was there for approximately two months, and I was mothered, which is a word they use you know, to define your home institution, to Joyceville Institution. I knew that I was approaching something fearful, because everybody that was on the van with me that day got suddenly quiet. And I remember thinking, wow, this place has everybody scared. It was very foreboding. It's like they knew what was coming. I didn't. My first impressions of federal incarceration were haunting. Just the smell, the odor. It's, it's a combination of body sweat, urine, feces, fear. The fear saturates everything, including the person. The air is stale, it's recirculated, it's choked with smoke. It's, it's almost unbreathable. The noise is deafening during the hours of the day that the machine is awake. It chokes the life right out of you. It was really surreal. It was like a dream. Somebody pinched me. There was actually days that I woke up after this. he was convicted, and I thought I had dreamt it. I don't think I stopped crying for a long time, to months, months before I could just look at the kids and realize, you know, that their father had been, his life had just been torn apart, not only our life. We had to tell them a lie just tell them that daddy was at work and, you know, what do you tell a five-year-old and two-year-old twins and a nine-month-old baby, what do you say? The quickest way out of an institution is to do the programs, to tow the line, to do what you're told. But if you're not that offender, if the crime's never been committed, who would honestly subject themselves to sexual behavior programming? I did not commit that crime. 
and I wasn't going to put myself in a program where I would have to one day sit in a, in a cluster of inmates and recount my crime. And as a result, I ended up in segregation. I can't imagine anybody being in solitary confinement and being able to keep their wits about them. It's, a, it's solitary confinement for 23 hours a day. It can break wills. I ended up spending 16 months in complete isolation, but I think that's where I flourished because once I was isolated and alone, I no longer had to contend with being Jamie Nelson, 07634C inmate. I was able to focus on my appeal. As a federal inmate, you have two options for moving forward with an appeal, an inmate stream and a solicitor stream. I refuse to do the appeal, and that's just a, my own personal policy that I've made, and that is that I want fresh eyes to look at the transcript. I poured over my documents, over the trial transcripts, and I did absolutely everything that I could to dot the I's and cross the T's. I was prepared wholeheartedly to prove my innocence. He didn't want me to go visit him in prison, so the last time I saw him was in 1996. I made the conscious decision that I wasn't going to have any visits from my family where I was portrayed as that convict where I was behind two-inch thick glass, where I was wearing that uniform. I just didn't want to have my father, my wife, my children see that. He would allow his father and a family friend to visit once. It was a Christmas social, and we were permitted to wear street clothing. It gave me the opportunity to just be Jamie without that wrapper, without that uniform. And during that visit, I, I had four wonderful hours with my dad. But Jamie had no idea that back at home, his family was about to dissolve. Children's Aid found out that he was convicted for sexual assault and just took the kids. I remember going to a home and being split from my two brothers. It was me and my sister. I got a lawyer, it took about four months. I got him back. We all got back together again, and then they took us away again. When they came and took the kids a second time, I literally broke down, packed a bag and left. Left my home, everything. After fighting for a year and a half, I wasn't getting anywhere. They weren't going to give me access to any of my kids. I literally lost my mind. I had a nervous breakdown. I ended up in Lac Saint-Jean. I don't know what brought me there, why I went there. I don't know. I think I just went, and when I stopped, I stopped. We finally reached the point, Marie and I, where we just stopped communicating. Um, I think Marie was afraid to let me know what had happened. And I found out via one of the chaplains at the prison. He came and told me that my children had been apprehended. How could I fault Marie for not being able to, to maintain a family and, and the order of that family with facing the deficits that she had to face? four children under five, work, babysitters, me in prison, rent, groceries, transportation. Like, I just couldn't even imagine what Marie was going through and how she was able to cope with it as long as she did. Like, I'm marveled by it. I've never felt disappointment, never. It was the circumstances of what we were caught up in. circumstance. I was there for almost a year so I could get myself back together and I said okay I gotta go and fight for the kids. So I came back to Ottawa in 98, called the lawyer told her I'm ready, I need to get my kids back, and she told me to get my life back together and try to get custody of Christina first. It got to a point that I was so stressed that I couldn't see my mom that I physically tried to take my own life at eight years old. I found glass, I need a second. Um, I found glass in the schoolyard 
and my friend Emily and my friend Victoria, they stopped me, and they told the teacher, and they came to stop me. We saw each other, and it was like, poof, right away. <laughs> yeah, sorry. She went through a lot, you know, like um, what eight-year-old tries to kill himself, you know. It makes me sad just thinking about it. Sorry. Yes, straight, please. I would never wish this upon anybody. I really wouldn't. Meanwhile, Kathy Fordham, the architect of their nightmare, had been busy spinning another web. And what Jamie and his family did not know is that a new ally had already appeared on the scene. My involvement in this case uh, started when Kathy Fordham phoned me uh, when I was working one night at the newspaper and complained that she'd been assaulted by two men while she was praying at a grotto in Vanier. I phoned the police and they confirmed that they had uh, started an investigation. But uh, about five days later, the detective phoned me and said to be careful about this woman because they thought that she was lying. Eventually, a couple weeks later, they did charge her with making a false police complaint. From the police, I found out that Kathy Fordham ran the place where uh, people who were accused of crimes were released to. A nurse who volunteered at the center had been keeping a secret diary in which she described the place as a zoo full of relapsed drunks and drug users. Although she reported that Kathy Fordham had done good things, such as helping women and children in distress, her attitude to men was alarming. For a story that I did, I tracked down a number of people who had been staying in uh, Kathy Fordham Center and uh, a number of the gentlemen had lived there, and I called them all together for a meeting at Patty's Pub. Uh, about a dozen of these guys showed up and they told me stories uh, that were quite wild about her extorting them to do different things, uh, some of them sexual, uh, uh, drugs in the uh, in the center, drinking, and the whole time her lording over all. She would take them to a, a bar when they weren't supposed to drink and then uh, have evidence that they drank and hold that over their head in order to extort uh, welfare checks out of them and things like that. Quite frequently breaching them and getting them sent back to jail to show that she mean business. By then, Kathy Fordham had been a complainant filing police charges against various men over 30 times. I phoned the police officer and I asked him to give me a list of all the cases where she had been a complainant accusing people of crimes. Way down on the list was uh, a gentleman who'd been convicted of a sexual assault and his name was Jamie Nelson. Oblivious of these developments, Jamie Nelson, hardened by jail, was going through his own transformation. By then, he tried to present his inmate appeal twice, but due to circumstances beyond his control, his scheduled appearance would be adjourned. And then, moments before his third appearance, lawyer Todd Ducharme approached him. He said, you know, you only have one shot at this, to impress these judges and show them that an error has been made. And he counseled me on the idea of postponing my court appearance and transferring from an inmate appeal to a solicitor's appeal. The downside was that I would serve the balance of my sentence. After serving 1,047 days, the day that I finally left was uh, a day unrivaled in my life. Uh, I knew that I was leaving the institution a different man, a changed man, a hard man. The first thing on my mind was clearing my name. Even with an experienced lawyer at his side, winning an appeal was hardly a sure thing. But what neither Todd Ducharme nor Jamie knew was the extent of Fordham's deception. Nor did they know that nine days before, an internal memorandum from the police was sent to the Crown Attorney's office. Would the scale of justice finally weigh in Jamie Nelson's favor and bring the startling new evidence to light in time for his appeal. I was released March 12, 1999, and was obligated to complete 18 months of federal parole. I was barred from entering Ottawa due to parole constrictions, so I served my parole in Stratford, Ontario. What Jamie Nelson did not know is that days after his release, information about Kathy Fordham had reached the Crown Prosecutor in charge of his appeal. In the months to come, the file on Fordham would continue to grow. One year later, she would be convicted of public mischief.
After uh, Kathy Fordham was convicted, I focused my attention on trying to find Jamie Nelson, and uh, I eventually gave Jamie a call. He said, you know I'm innocent, and I said, yeah, I believe you. And he said, that's the first time anybody's ever said that to me, and uh, he started crying. The tide of injustice had finally turned for Jamie Nelson. One day I, I received a phone call from Todd Ducharme, and he indicated that I needed to get to Toronto right away. He had received a factum of information, court folders, statements, a mountain of information. I didn't know that she was as prolific in the court system as she had become as a false alleger. Still, it would take another year before Jamie would finally get a date to appear before the Court of Appeal. By then, the Crown Attorney had already expressed his intention to concede. I will forever remember the phone call from Jamie, 11 o'clock or 11.30 the night before. It was just such an emotional phone call that it was just unbelievable. Just the whole thing, we were sort of vindicated after years of fighting. It was just like this unbelievable. I just still get goosebumps. With lots of ceremony, the three judges entered the courtroom and within five minutes, the event was over. It took me six years to climb the steps to that courtroom and the whole process ended in five minutes. I was doing my best not to break down because it was the one thing that I had waited so long to hear, that I was an innocent man and that my name had been cleared. Todd Ducharme was with me. The Crown, Scott Hutchison, walked over to me, hugged me, and he said it was the best outcome that he's ever seen in his career. I'm not really worried if there's anybody out there that thinks, oh, well, he just got away with it, you know. He beat the system. I didn't beat the system. The system beat me. So people that think that I got away with something just need to maybe do a little more than scratch the surface and just know the story, know the players. I was watching the news, it was my day off, and Christina was outside playing. She was about nine years old at the time. And I was flicking through the channels, and my, literally my tongue felt like it fell to the floor, and I was like, oh my God, that's Jamie. When I saw him, I was like, well, who's that? And then she reminded me, and that's when somehow it clicked. I was like, he was part of our family. Hours after his appeal, triumphant, Jamie would return to Ottawa, where he had not been in six years. I immediately went to my father's house, uh, but the first person outside of family that I felt obligated, that I needed to see, was Ken Hall. I was standing outside number six court, which is bail court, which is where he had his bail hearing, and he tapped me, some, I got tapped on the, on the shoulder, and I turned around and he was standing there, and we just hugged. Just hugged. It was just great. Got to the emotional part of criminal law, which it shouldn't be, I guess it should be objective, but no. <laughs> it was just really emotional. We ended up getting entangled in a bunch of interviews, and at one point he handed me a little post-it note like a little handwritten message and I was about to crumple it up and he said, no, you want that one. So I opened it up and it Call said Marie. Marie and then a phone number. I showed up early because my dad drove me and um, I just happened to look over and there was someone walking across the street and I could just see the way he was walking. I'm like, oh my God, Dad, that's Jamie. I'm uh, 300, 250 feet away. I hear a car horn, very busy intersection. I don't know what car just beeped the horn. I just know that it was meant for me. And I turned around and I literally walked right to the car door. Pulled me out of the car and all three of us were crying. <laughs> <laughs> it was nice. That yeah, was nice. It was a beautiful way to be reunited. Yeah. It was, uh, you couldn't script that moment any better. Yeah, it was good. just poetic, it was beautiful. But the surprises were only beginning for Jamie that Friday in August, when he learned that Kathy Fordham would be in court on Monday for sentencing on charges of uttering death threats against a former lover. Kathy was actually facing Judge Fraser, the very judge that convicted me. Just the irony involved in the whole event, just, I, I got lost in that. I remember thinking, I hope he meets out as much justice with her as he did with me. He would spend the day before with his father, gathering the strength to face his accuser. I needed to see her face that man, the judge, to see her as the accused. When I arrived at the courtroom, I saw all the other men. There must have been a half dozen of us. We filled a row. 
The judge was so concerned he actually indicated to us that there would be no outburst or he would close the courtroom. So we all sat there very hushed and Kathy was next to her lawyer doing her very best to hide her head and conceal her shame. But we just all sat there and watched. The judge would acknowledge Jamie with a simple nod before he stepped down. The judge was obligated to recuse himself from the case because he had been involved with her in a trial matter earlier as a, a victim. I guess that rocked her world too, seeing the same judge. It took her about an hour to leave the courtroom after the proceedings were done. And when she finally mustered the courage to leave the room and walk out of the courtroom, we all exited behind her. I remember sincerely hoping that Kathy realized that her actions had consequences. And I also wondered if she ever realized what the cost was. I never really understood why she concealed herself in, uh, in that blanket. Uh, if she's a legitimate victim of sexual assault, then why conceal yourself? If you're a legitimate victim, then be the legitimate victim. That angered me that. I don't hate Kathy Fordham. I hope she gets help, but I also hope there's justice too. I want to see her serve the time that my husband served and to see what it feels like to go through pain and to lose everything that you ever loved. Jamie's loss would include more than the children. It would include the person who stood by him through the darkest, loneliest hours. Being here today reminds me so much of my father. He was extremely supportive, never wavered. Then he passed away just as I exonerated myself, just as I cleared my name. I miss him. I had just been invited to be a keynote speaker at an international convention on wrongful convictions, and we marveled at how my whole circumstance had come full circle. My dad was just exceptionally proud of me, and uh, that night he died. He had a massive heart attack in his sleep. But he got to see me clear my name. He got to see the most important part. As for the children, that chapter will never close. Unfortunately, the system that we were embattled with uh, isn't a forgiving system. And we're in a, in a position where we're a holding pattern, if you'd like to call it that. No. We're, we're actually obligated to wait until Matthew and Melissa and Ryan, reach right. the age of 16 before they can come and knock on our door. We have notes, um, we have letters that we've put into their files. I would truly enjoy to have them back. I'd be able to be the older sister I'm supposed to be. And I can't. I have learned, like, in the past, like, I could dream about them. My mom would be like, can you not talk to me about it at least in the morning, you know? Because I'll think about it all day, and that's what I'll think about. Remember that if I tell her at night, she can't sleep. So I try to keep it to myself. And I don't want to do it for my dad either, because I don't want him to feel like in any way it was his fault, or he misses them also. It was his kids, too. It took a piece of his heart when it, when it happened. Definitely changed him. Well, I'm not a father of five anymore. I haven't measured all that yet. I'm harder. I'm angrier. I'm not a very trusting person of other people anymore. Quick to judge. Still very angry, sometimes. I try to convince myself that I've dealt with it. I guess I haven't. I just try my very best every day to move forward. Instead of taking a step backwards or sideways, I'd prefer it be forward. And nine times out of 10, I get to move forward. With Christina, with Marie, we do it together. Kathy Fordham was eventually convicted and served six months in jail. As for Jamie Nelson, his goal today is to get his message out. I'm currently in the process of completing a book about this nightmare. 
that gives me the avenue to send and to share my message with each and every individual that chooses to go into the field of criminal justice. They're gonna have the opportunity to see how justice misfires. I hope that each person that has the opportunity to hear my story or read the book just garners one positive thing from it, and that's that they recognize that what happened to me could easily happen to anybody. It's very, very tangible freedom. I hope everybody appreciates that. That's my goal.